Okay, I think we can start. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. And welcome to the Astro 3D ECR Astronomers in Australia seminar series. Uh, my name is Dorota Bayer, and uh, I am an Astro 3D postdoc at the Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. Uh, my co chair today is Dr. Meredith Joyce from the Australian National University in Canberra. Before we begin, we must acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were Australia's first astronomers, and we acknowledge their long-standing systems of knowledge on which we continue to build. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today. I am speaking to you today from the land of our wandering people of the Kulin Nation. And my co-chair Meredith is joining us from the land of the Nanaval people. Our first speaker, Sabine Belstad, is speaking to you from the land of the Badjuknagar people. And our second speaker, Piyush Sharda, is speaking from the land of the Nanaval people. We pay our respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all first peoples joining us here today. So why are we here? Um, this series is facilitated by Astro 3D, the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for all sky astrophysics in three dimensions. COVID-19 has affected our ability to travel and present at international seminars this year. Especially for us in Australia, the time zones mean that often meetings take place at two or three in the morning. And this lack of opportunity to network could disadvantage junior astronomers when entering the job market. This series aims to combat these issues by providing a platform for junior Australian astronomers to present their work to the world. Now let's move to our first speaker, um, Sabine Belstead, who is a postdoc at the University of Western Australia in Perth. Sabine will be talking to you about the cosmic evolution of star formation and metallicity. Sabine, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for the welcome and thanks everyone for coming out to this um, seminar series. It's always very exciting to be here in Australia and be able to present to an international community. Uh, so I'll be talking today about the cosmic evolution of star formation and metallicity using the SED fitting code prospect. Um, and this is a, a large amount of work done with a, a group a larger team, which is here on the screen. Now I'll be talking about SEDs quite a bit during this talk. And an SED is just a spectral energy distribution. Now a spectral energy distribution describes how does the relative flux of a galaxy change with different wavelengths. Um, it can be regarded pretty much like a spectrum, just over much, much broader wavelength range. And generally we measure these much, much more coarsely. Um, so I've got a, a schematic, I guess, here in front of us showing what um, an SED might look like for a classic galaxy, uh, all the way through from the, um, the X-rays on the right through to the radio on the left. But in particular, it's, it's the middle part of this SED that I'm particularly interested in. And that's the portion of an SED from the far infrared through to the far ultraviolet. Now, how do we measure such things? Normally we do that through imaging rather than spectroscopy. Here's an example of a spectral energy distribution measured for an example galaxy. The points represent the brightness measurements taken from imaging for this particular object. And then we've got various lines on there representing model SEDs to try and replicate this galaxy. So if we're able to correctly model this SED to match the observations, in principle, the, the ingredients that went into that model for example, the stellar mass, the star formation rate, the star formation history of that galaxy, we should be able to extract as parameters. And this is a process that is done fairly ubiquitously throughout astrophysics as a mechanism for learning about galaxies that we can see in the sky. But in order to get out these properties that we're interested in, there are a few other things that we need to consider and get right. And these include things like the dust content or the gas phase metallicity of galaxies. Now, in order to model an SED, there are a few components that we need to consider, like I've just said. Um, here's just a schematic of what a, a galaxy might look like in the eyes of an SED fitter. Uh, we have stars, that's a key ingredient. We have dust, 
and dust can form various different components, either specific clouds around young birth clouds or generally distributed throughout the galaxy as part of the interstellar medium. And then you can also get really fancy and start talking about components like active galactic nuclei. For the sake of this talk, I'm dealing with the low redshift universe and I'm going to be ignoring active galactic nuclei. So really, let's focus on just the stellar and dust component for now. Essentially what you're interested in is how do stars emit? And you can model that and I've shown here in an, an example blue. But you don't see just the starlight, you see the starlight that's come through the dust. And so young stars might be attenuated by dust around birth clouds. Uh, all stars are attenuated by some amount of dust in the interstellar medium. And so then you get a slightly reduced stellar emission. But of course, all of that light that's been absorbed by dust has to go somewhere. And generally that's re-radiated at longer wavelengths. And then you get a dust peak. So this classic two peak structure in SEDs that comes from the stars and then the re-radiation of dust. If we take that total component, we end up with an SED. So that's how we get the modeling component done. But for the stars themselves, depending on how old those stars are, makes a big difference to this distribution. Um, so for example, in the top panel here, I'm showing what is a star formation history, and you'll see a lot of those during this talk. We're looking at age on the x-axis, so we're getting toward the start of the universe, toward the left, right rather, and then the star formation rate on the y-axis. So the redder points here represent galaxies that formed their stars really early on and then haven't formed much recently. And then that varies to all these different modeled histories through to this purple, which represents a galaxy that's formed its stars quite recently. Now the corresponding SEDs that such galaxies would produce are shown on the bottom. And for those of you that aren't used to looking at SEDs, this gives you a hint as to just looking at an SED, what does this tell us about it? Uh, the first thing you might notice that the bluer SEDs are higher up in this plot. That just tells us that younger stars are brighter. Keep in mind, all of these SEDs represent the same number of stars for this particular schematic. So that's just younger stars being brighter. The other thing that you might notice quite dramatically is that in this um, ultraviolet portion of the spectrum, so we're getting to shorter wavelengths and that's ultraviolet here, we're getting a lot more emission for the younger stars versus the older stars. So this is that classic thing of older galaxies being redder, younger ones being bluer. So there's a lot about the history of star formation that we can extract from these SEDs if we model them correctly. The tricky thing is, however, just because we've produced a model that looks like the SET, SED doesn't tell us that our actual underlying model of the history is correct. That's a tricky thing for us to know. And it's something that we want to be able to identify as well enough. So the work that I'm showing here now is using a large volume limited sample of galaxies that should represent a chunk of the universe applying SED fitting to that so that we hopefully recover things that we know. That includes the cosmic star formation, metallicity population evolution, and also the cosmic metal density. And so these are three things that I wanna to touch on here in this talk. Starting off with cosmic star formation, here are some plots that I'm sure many of us have seen many times. So both of these are different ways of representing what is the cosmic star formation history? So as we look back in time, either presented by a redshift on the um, left or look back time on the right. What is the density of star formation that we see at any given point in the universe? And the review by Madow and Dickinson in 2014 showed this one very, very clearly, where we've got a rising of star formation history in the early universe. By about redshift two, we've got a peak of the amount of star formation we see, and then that declines through to the present day. This is very well observed. There's a lot of studies that are focused on this, but to actually replicate this through SED fitting, so if we have a sample of galaxies in the present day and actually reproduce this from their histories rather than looking to high redshift to make this measurement, this is actually quite a challenge to do correctly. Here's an example of some studies that have attempted to do this in the past using SED fitting codes called Prospector on the left and Bagpipes on the right. I won't go into the detail of all of the aspects of these codes that are different. Um, there are many things. <laughs> But you can see that the kinds of cosmic star formation histories that they infer are quite dramatically different. So generally at recent times, they tend to be roughly right. It's because young stars are easy to get right. But as we get to the older part of the history, as you can see this one on the left is just, it's scooping underneath. So it's not really getting this peak at all. And why the other one gets a peak, it gets them at completely the wrong part of the universe. So if this is wrong, it probably tells us that statistically our star formation histories are wrong, and then that has trickle on effects through all the other parameters that we're interested in. I wanna have a brief aside to talk about metallicity. 
because in the context of SED fitting, we generally hear a lot about stars, but metallicity tends to be ignored. So here I've got this observed cosmic star formation history again. And if for a given galaxy, we force it to form stars at a very low metallicity throughout its whole history. So this isn't, re this is, no one would do this, but let's just say they would. It means that in order to produce colors that are roughly right, you probably have to overestimate the age to get that right, because we know that age and metallicity are very degenerate. If we go through this exercise for real data, that's exactly what we see. The cosmic star formation history that we derive is much, much, much too old. Okay, so we can see that metallicity has quite a predictable effect here. We can alleviate this a little bit. We can increase the metallicity it's allowed to have. The same effect occurs, just not as dramatically. You can say, let's we'll say we let our galaxies form stars at solar metallicity for their whole history. We see now the opposite effect happening. So realistically, we're now overestimating our metallicities, which means we're now underestimating the ages of our galaxies. We have to produce them too young to get them to be the right color. The solution that's often implemented in the literature is just to say, okay, well, let's just let metallicity be a free parameter and then we'll let the metallicity be about right. From a cosmic star formation history perspective, that looks a little bit better, but we're now no longer getting that proper peak. We're kind of washing out the features in star formation throughout the universe. You could take a very different approach and say, well, how about we just naively say a metallicity starts at zero and it ends up at some value and we evolve metallicity linearly throughout time with no other information and we reproduce a nice peak, it's just at the wrong part of the universe. So clearly this idea of saying metallicity increases with time is too naive. So this is where we've really tried to do something that's a little bit more sophisticated so that we don't end up with this huge range of cosmic star formation histories and we actually end up with something that looks like what we see in the real universe. Assuming constant is something that's really frequently done. But if you have a star formation history that is constant, so if you are constantly forming stars in the history of the galaxy, you might naively, you might expect that metallicity actually increases in time. And that follows the stellar mass buildup. If you have a galaxy that forms all of its stars really early on and then nothing, we would expect that the metallicity evolves quickly early on and then plateaus. And so this is exactly the kind of implementation we've now built within our SED fitting parameters to produce the results I'm about to show you. Is this a reasonable thing to do? Yes, we think so, order of magnitude. Um, here we've got four example galaxies from the semi-analytic model shark. Um, we've arbitrarily scaled these such that they fall on top of each other, but essentially the, the mass evolution of the galaxy is shown in black and the metallicity is shown in orange. And there's plenty of stochasticity and wiggling, but the two do indeed follow each other and they're a far cry from metallicity just being constant with time. So we think this is a pretty good step forward. So what have we actually done with this technique? I'm using gamma data for the sake of the work that I'm showing today. And so this is a, um, a large redshift survey that's highly complete. And we have imaging in 20 wavelengths from the far ultraviolet to the far infrared. So it's a nice data set. In particular, I'm looking at about 7,000 galaxies in a chunk at less, redshift less than 0.06. And so you can see that here in redshift versus magnitude. I'm using the SED fitting code prospect. It's relatively new. I won't go into too many details of that, but by all means ask questions about the technicalities toward the end. But in particular, the exciting thing about it is that we can create quite a bit of flexibility, which means that we're able to really get into evolving metallicities for individual galaxies. Here's an example of what that might look like for an individual galaxy. There's the observational SED shown here on the left. Those are the data points. And then the model we've produced and that's shown on top in lines. On the right, the upper panel shows the star formation history that we've derived. You can see that's quite old. So the bulk of the star formation happened near the start of the universe and it's declined. And then the interesting thing is below, we should now show the derived metallicity history. Now, because of our implementation, we are forcing that metallicity to follow the shape of the stellar mass buildup. So luckily for us, we don't need to do anything parameterization wise specifically for the shape. We don't need to add any free parameters, but the one free parameter we do add is the value of the final metallicity. So that allows us to scale that metallicity a little bit. Keeping in mind this metallicity history, what that actually means is at each epoch, what is the metallicity that the stars form? Here's a different example. This is a spiral galaxy. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, we're seeing a star formation history that produces most of the stars near the middle of the universe. We're still forming stars in the present day. And you can see the corresponding metallicity evolution is slightly different as a result. 
And then you get a very different kind of galaxy like this one. It's a very low mass, quite blue galaxy. The SED has quite a different shape. And you can see that filtering through to the star formation history, which is very recent. And then ditto, the metallicity history only kicks in at recent times with then slightly lower metallicities. So what happens when we take a sample of galaxies that are representative of the universe, we take their star formation histories and we stack them all together, we end up with an estimate for the cosmic star formation history. And that's what I'm showing here on the top panel. So all different kinds of observations are shown as data points. And then that orange line on top shows the cosmic star formation history that we've derived with this technique. It's not perfect, but really excitingly, it looks pretty close to what the observations are showing. Um, these observations show a little bit of variation in the very early universe. Um, we won't distinguish between any of those because realistically, I'm not going to trust an SED model of stars that are 12 giga years or older. But all things considered, this is a pretty excellent um, recovery of the cosmic star formation history. And then on the lower panel, the corresponding stellar mass buildup. The fact that this roughly matches indicates to us that we're probably at a statistical level forming stars in the right epoch of the universe. And that allows us to trust the stellar masses that we get much more closely. We can divide this up now into things that are a little bit more interesting because of course we have this star formation history information for individual galaxies. So one of the ways in which we can do that is we can divide up this cosmic star formation history into the contributions by galaxies of different present day stellar masses. So here this black line shows the same cosmic star formation history I just showed. But in the colored points, these are now the contributions by different mass galaxies. So the most massive galaxies today are shown in the darker colors, whereas the least massive are shown in yellow. You can see this probably quite clearly from the top panel, but also from the bottom. These crosses represent the epoch for each bin at which half of the mass was formed. And that epoch moves forward as you get to lower mass. This isn't anything new. This is galaxy downsizing, something that we know very well. The nice thing is that we're actually recovering this without any prior input from SED fitting alone now. If you take all of the galaxies in the sample, plot their stellar masses against the age at which half their mass was formed, so this is an individual galaxy by galaxy basis, you can see this trend coming through here again with lower mass galaxies having been formed more recently. This Five minutes. Plot, thank you. This particular plot is colored by morphology. And so you can see here quite clearly that morphology is also a key, um, divides quite clearly into this parameter space. And so if you divide up by morphology as well, the cosmic star formation history, you can see this happening as well. The early type galaxies that we generally perceive to be red and old, indeed, they form the bulk of their stars near the peak of cosmic star formation, whereas at more recent days, it's late time galaxies that form their stars. Now I'm really, privileged actually to be speaking about metallicity from the perspective of SED fitting because it's not normally done. Metallicity is generally perceived to be a nuisance parameter, um, but let's dig a little bit deeper into what we can do if we've actually done something sensible. Metallicity is harder to constrain, so I'm now looking at a smaller sample of this subset that actually have constrained values of metallicity. And here I'm showing the distributions of metallicities that we get divided through by different morphologies. And from my perspective, it's exciting already that different morphologies were starting to see different behaviors of metallicity, with early type galaxies generally tending to have higher metallicities than lower. If we now compare this with, for an overlapping sample, an actual spectral line measurement of the metallicity, we were very excited to see that these in fact do correlate. The scanner is large, that's unsurprising given that we're using imaging data to derive these results, but it's telling us that the metallicities we're getting are not arbitrary, they're not noise, they're not nuisance parameters, they represent something about the actual properties of the galaxy. We can plot these on the well-known mass metallicity relation. And it's really reassuring to see that yes, in the low redshift universe, the metallicities that we're recovering from these galaxies are actually consistent with the distributions we get for populations from actual metallicity measurements. So this is really reassuring. But with our forensic technique, we can do one step better. We don't only have the metallicities at the present era for these galaxies, we've in principle inferred the whole history of metallicity evolution for individual galaxies. So I've shown here a mass metallicity plot in the bottom middle, and then four example galaxies around. These all have different properties. In each case, the top panel is the star formation history, the bottom panel is the metallicity history. And it, if we go step back in epochs of look back time, we can predict or we can plot how these galaxies move through this mass metallicity space. 
which means if we do this for a whole sample, oops, forget to my next slide, there we are. We can now look at what the mass metallicity relation does at different epochs in look back time. And so that's what these different panels are doing that we're now stepping through. So you can see this number here represents the epoch at which we now are, and all of the gray points represent the forensic results that we've had for our four and a half thousand galaxies, roughly. What you'll note is that all of these colored points represent observations at high redshift epochs. And the amazing thing is that these actually tend to agree pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well over about 12 giga years of time. Um, I've shown it all here on one single plot to give it a better overview. You can see quite dramatically this evolution of metallicity. So you can see how metallicity um, in the mass metallicity relation drops with time and how it agrees. Some of you might be able to spot some key differences. I won't talk about those, but feel free to ask me about those later. And finally, we can start to dip our toes a bit into the world of the cosmic metal density. This isn't something that we have particularly many observations of, but there was a nice review done by um, Peru and Hark last year showing what do we know about various components? What is the, dens the, the density of metals in them? So here I'm showing some observations of stellar metal density in yellow, uh, the metal density in ionized gas in red, We've got neutral gas in magenta and intercluster and intergroup gas in blue. So we might make a very hand wavy argument to say, based on these observations, what might we expect the global evolution and cosmic metal density in gas to look like? Now I can just arbitrarily fit a form to some of these colored points and I, I get it, this is done very roughly. But if we take all of these different gas components and we add them up, we end up with something like this cyan line. The reason why that's something that's interesting for us to do is that with our parameterization, we can actually extract with our volume limited sample, what we expect to be this metal density from a metallicity evolution for the stars and the gas separately. If I do that and compare to this, I end up with these solid lines. So the cyan line here represents the gas metal density that we receive, we recover in our work compared with the stars in orange. And it's quite cool to see that this dashed line and this, this solid line are actually pretty close agreement with each other. So the metal density that we're recovering through SED fitting alone from imaging already gives us metal densities that are broadly consistent with observations. How exciting is that? So I'll just conclude at this point here to say that with a careful consideration of not only how we're modeling the star formation history, but also the corresponding gas phase metallicity, we can actually recover things like the cosmic star formation history, we can recover the mass metallicity relation and not just at one epoch, but at many. And then we can also start doing exciting things like looking at the cosmic metal density and seeing what we learn from that. Um, and so this really gives us um, some more courage to pursue these SED fitting and believe the properties a little bit more keenly. And I'll note as well that devils, you might hear about more about in the future. This is like a high redshift version of gamma. Um, so keep an eye out for this kind of work that'll be done at much higher redshift. And in particular, keep an eye out for some work out done by Jessica Thorne, who's doing some really exciting stuff. And I'll leave it there for any questions. Okay, um, thank you for, for the great talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, you can raise your hand or, or blurt out or post in the chat. Okay, yeah, we have one from um, Gerhard Maurer, go ahead. Hi, so this is a pretty uh, simple question. Um, have you tried uh, the a simple constraint of giving all your galaxies um, the star formation rate um, as a function of time evolution of, of the university, universe as a whole? I, I realize that's not necessarily realistic for any individual galaxy, but I'm just curious if that's something you tried. You mean if we just force the star formation history essentially to take the form of the cosmic star formation history? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not something I've tried. Um, I guess the consequence of that would be you you definitely get out the cosmic star formation history um, and you would definitely produce the right amount of stellar mass in the universe as a whole. Um, it'd be interesting to know what that tells you about the galaxies themselves though. Yeah, yeah, I, I imagine you, you may have, you know, you won't have your nice distinction between the red and blue galaxies, uh, um, uh, which is quite nice. Mm -hmm. But no, that's not something I've done. Okay, thanks. 
Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, any any other questions? Um, from Hamsa, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Uh, I had one question about the way when you're recovering these parameters. Uh, as you probably know, there are these different approaches in the uh, literature, um, one of them by the Carnegie Group, and there's another by the Lily et al. and other people who've been developing this uh, main sequence and its evolution. And I think the main difference in the way they're approaching it is how much of scatter you'll expect because of individual star formation histories. So does your work kind of, um, you know, um, fall in one of the two kind of, uh, you know, can you say something about the scatter? Is it like a flock of birds or is it kind of like the main sequence as advocated by the, these other groups? Mm. Um, I'm not immediately very familiar with the exact results that you're referring to, but um, the student that I refer to, Jessica Thorne, has done quite a bit of work with looking at the actual main sequence that is derived at different epochs through this technique. Um, and it actually looks pretty consistent with observations that we're seeing of the main sequence. Um, any scatter in the main sequence that you would expect from stochastic star formation, so let's say, for example, you've got a, a temporary burst in star formation that lifts a galaxy up above the main sequence, that's not something, unfortunately, that we're able to model at all within our approach. So the star formation histories that we assume for individual galaxies are parametric. They've got a handful of parameters, and they're smooth. They're very smooth. Um, so you get the broad scale changes, but none of that short term fluctuation like we would see with classic simulated galaxies as well. Um, so any of that scatter that would be produced from long term different behaviors that we might achieve, um, but nothing at that short term scale, if that answers your question. I see. Thanks a lot. OK, um, actually, we're, we're a little bit over time, so we're going to go ahead and switch to the next speaker now. But um, thank you very much, uh, Sabina, for the great talk. Thank you.